Welcome to Discover Jazz 2003. This is the third year that I've been invited to, um, I guess they call me the critic in residence, and we've had some wonderful sessions in this room and um, expect to have several more this year. Uh, usually we do them before the concert. This is a little different tonight because we get to do them after we've heard the music played. Um, we're going to be not only speaking to Andrew Hill, but also with Greg Tardy and maybe uh, the other members of the quartet will join us later as well. Let me um, uh, start by asking Andrew. Um, I've had the pleasure of hearing Andrew play in three or four different configurations, uh, trio, quartet, sextet. His last recording was a big band recording. And the first thing I was curious about was whether um, there is a format that strikes you as the way you hear the music in your head, or is the music written for all formats? Well, it does mainly depend upon how I hear it in my head. You know, like writing down is just a vehicle, you know, for documenting the idea, you know, claiming the idea for a certain extent to share it. With, with other people for their in interpretation. And it's something, you know, that is almost alive, that breathes e every time you perform it or you perform it with a different group. So what what I do is I have a different group for every occasion. You know, I mean, different music, you know, I try to continually write because if you're c composers, that's still one of the biggest thrills in your life is to hear, hear music being played. And, and and then to hear it being played by so, so many great artists to the decades, you, you know, that's, that's a joy I think few people have experienced. Now, many um, composers and band leaders have very particular ideas about how they want their music to sound. Others uh, take an approach that provides more freedom of interpretation to their collaborators. I wonder if you consider yourself um, uh, well, which end of that spectrum would you fall on, would you say? Well, the way I would approach it is uh, instead of, you know, sharing the, the, the creative process with others, I get people who I trust, you know, you know, like everyone, you know, people who love music, that, that you can trust their musical decisions. And then it, spontaneous because no one has to be monitored in, in, in order to blend their skills in a certain way with the, the, to get a certain type of homogeneous you know type situation now i recall back in the 60s um i, I believe you made a statement that you were not going to be an accompanist anymore or a side man that you were going to play your own music that you had dedicated yourself to your own music is that Accurate, would you say? Well, well, well you, you know, some, sometimes I talk to people even when I was doing clinical work during the years. If a person felt the same way about everything as they did 20 years ago, you would call them retarded. <laughs> 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 you, you, you say, say, well, you know, they haven't made any progress o o over the years, so I can't qualify that statement. <laughs> but. But I wonder if, if it's a, um, if perhaps at that point in your development it was a necessary decision to make in terms of pursuing the integrity of your own music, or how did you see it at the time when you came to well, that decision? When, when I saw it at the time, I saw it, I would say, devoid of a certain middle class philosophical base, you know, due to relativity and certain type of common experience. You, you know, I, I saw it at, at the moment, you know, someone come to you and they ask you a question and you honest them at the moment, you answer them as honestly as you can, you know, you know, you know like the statement you just made, but the way I, I saw it was just living, you know, you know, I just was living my, my, my life, you know, I was and I have always been fortunate enough to be supported while I lived my life. It's not that I didn't want other experiences, you know, but 
you know, I figure, you know, what a great or, or small my obligation to myself was to write music and survive and, and hear it perform. Okay. Now, I wonder if I could ask the members of the quartet um, a two-part question, okay? Um, and the first part is, uh, if I ask you to um, compare the experience of playing Andrew's music with other music you play, what strikes you as uh, the distinctive elements about Andrew's music? And then I'd also like to know if you found, after you began working with Andrew, any surprises based on what you might have expected just from knowing his music through recordings or listening. Let me start with Greg. Well, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well, the thing that I, uh, it, the things I'm going to say are pretty logical, I suppose, is that, uh, is that uh, I find a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of freedom. Um, I can go a lot of places playing with Andrew that I, I can't go with a lot of other groups that I've played with over the years, including my own group. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and so it's like, I, it's really helped stretch my ears out a whole lot. And as far as surprises, uh, I mean, every night's a surprise. Uh, uh, every night's a surprise to seeing what we can explore up here. So, um, so I guess it's okay. kind of a... John, you got anything? Um, for me, yeah, it's, it's almost sort of the way I want to play music, you know, what we're doing up here and how Andrew writes and how we're playing as a group. And so for me, it's, it's almost really natural, you know, to play in this sort of environment. Um, yeah, and yeah, like Greg said, every night is a surprise. <laughs> no, but seriously, you know, a lot of music and, and creativity being emphasized, you know, he's always been supportive in, um, and everybody exploring their own voice within the context of the music, you know, which is so broad, as you, as you, just, as you just heard. But um, I wasn't surprised, but it was refreshing that he um, didn't want anybody to play like Yeah, riding the wave. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be nice if, like, every every person that we work with, or for me anyway, if every leader was just, you know, like Andrew, you know, that yeah. allowed that. I mean, I think it should be that way, that you should be able to just express yourself freely and not have any kind of confines or constraints or, you know, oh, I need to play this way. You know? It's like, you should just be able to be free. Well, again, let me direct this question to the band because for all the freedom in Andrew's music, it's never struck my ear as free music in the sense no, that no, there no, isn't no. concept, melodic and rhythmic and harmonic structures that define the character of, of the musical experience. Um, and one of the things that's magical about it to me is that there's so much information and content with so much leeway yeah. at the yeah. same time. Uh, is that an accurate Description, yeah, yeah, yeah very accurate. Yeah, yeah. No, no freedom without, you know, discipline. Exactly. You know, it's, like a, it's like an equal, equal balance. Yeah. You know, the higher forms of what people call quote unquote free are probably yeah. like as equally high. And the amount of discipline being applied right. in that situation to, 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 you know, if you're gonna, if, you know, if, 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 if approach it in a musical and you know, creative situ, situ, um, context, really, you know, it's not just.
Now, Andrew, um, again, something that's impressed me over time about your music, and uh, Nasheed touched on some of the great people who recorded with you years ago, and your ability to find, uh, as we evolve and as we go forward, new artists of that stature who can bring the same uh, inspiration to your music. And I wonder uh, how, what, what, what is the test you apply? How do you know when someone is right for your music? Well, you know, it's, it's just a, a part of, of looking at, at even my participation in music as being part of a pantheon uh, of what has come before me and, and what will, will will come after me, you know, because it's still no know, know how littered one one may put it, you know, it's still part of, of, of a tr tradition, you know, still what it is, you know. So I, I look for people, you know, with the love of, of, of music, you know, who understand the, the, the tradition, you know, because, you know, like you have echoes of the past combined with the present and, and, and the future, you know, so, you know, you know, like, like we just got through playing with, with a big orchestra, all of us, with, with some British m m musicians, and, and, and they had it, you know, it's, you know, you really don't, well, in my life now, I don't have to look for it. It just reveals it itself to me because I recognize it when I hear it. Let me just ask a couple of more questions then. I'm sure that some of the people who have stayed might have a few questions to ask as well. Um, some musicians, it is said, take their technical limitations and turn them into their conceptions. I've always had the feeling with you that technique has never been an issue, that perhaps you had to decide what parts of your technique to apply to the music. But I wonder how you feel virtuosity ranks within the hierarchy of musical values, if you will. Well, you know, I, I try not to be judgmental only because, you know, you know music usually fits the sociological mores of the time that it is. So as the music and and the society progress and, and evolve, the, the musicians evolve, you know, where once you could say, well, it, it come from the church, you know, came from the field hollers, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Now, m m musicians are more dexterous, you know, they're more, more dexterous, and then if, if they have a music, the feeling for music doesn't mean a completely different part of the same music is revealing itself, you know, and it's being validated by the presence of, of, of the younger musicians, you know, performing. The, the music, you know, so music is, to me, is, is just an evolution, you know, and, and it's just the, the, the life of it justifies itself by, by the chronological, cross chronological Cross section, you know, chronologically, artists who, who are participating in it. Now, um, did I get near that question? I think I was out, sure. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, <laughs> well, what the heck? I take it to mean that uh, that technique is a personal it was matter. Good. You, you like today? <laughs> um, for those of us who have been following your music, there have been periods of frustration because you've gone for several years without touring, without performing. Some, sometimes um, almost a whole decade might go by between recordings. And I know you spend a lot of that time teaching and a lot of that time uh, still playing, but perhaps not in the centers where you attract mm -hmm. press attention and things like this. But I often wonder, particularly with composers, because I've had composers say to me, you know, I can sit in my studio and write my music and, and that fulfills me. But for those of us on the other side of the experience, the audience who hear it, since we're fulfilled by the performance, I wonder where performance and the audience and that exchange um, ranks within your hierarchy. Well, the, the audience, you know, I look at the audience, I say, well, when, when jazz was the popular music, you know, before it evolved into an art form, you know, the period of the 60s, the 70s, it, it had a very 
sophisticated you know, audience, you, you know, sort of you know, things that sound experimental to people now you know, with, with just or, ordinary to, to, to the listeners. And so you have a listener base who's been listening to the music all their life and who ears may be more sophisticated than the people who play the music, even though, they, <laughs> you, you know, really, in, in terms of, of the pantheon, the continuum. So, so the, you know, as, as you know, when a sage meditate, he, he meditate, and when he gets the message or answer or whatever, he, he goes deeper in, into to isolation. But, but an artist, you know, you know, once an idea revealed itself to you, you have to, to go in, into the world, and it's good to, you know, come back into the world and, and, and have an idea that that's, that's accepted and impl implemented by society itself. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to let some of the audience, if we have <coughs> anyone who has any questions to add, so I don't monopolize this whole... Yeah. Well, well, you don't write one, you know, every music, you know, the, the same way, you know, certain things in, in, in inspire you. Sometimes you you may have, you know, I may have a narrative, you know, but that, that that's rare because I mean I have to control, you know, the the, the flow of, of, of the music, you know, like in in the opera they don't say, well, you know, whether it's the recitative, you know, where a lot of people. Or area, you know. So, in, in, in the music, it's all, almost the same way. Well, you know, because that's what an idea is, is. It's like a representational art, you know, where the art really it can't stand it for itself musically sometimes. But you put a label on it, you know, people can identify and intellectualize. Last, you know, so so I really rarely do that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else out there? You know, I, I do want to take a minute since we have all of the members of the quartet and these um, three musicians who you heard with Andrew are three of the uh, finest uh, and in terms of their future, the most promising artists around today. So I just wanted to give them the opportunity to talk about some of the other music they're doing and they're making now and, mm -hmm. and what they've been up to because somebody like Greg, who I haven't run into in three or four years, I want to catch up and see what he's been about, and then I want to ask John and Nishit what's, what's been going on. Uh, well, as far as me, I've been uh, mostly playing with Andrew, and um, I, I, uh, I play in several bands of uh, Dave Douglas, the, his sextet, his uh, um, um, group that plays with the Trisha Brown Dance Company. We both, both groups have played here within the last couple of years, and... Uh, and um, and um, miscellaneous other little projects with Dave and and uh, Susie Ibera, drummer. Uh, we have a quartet together, and um, so we we're working on some stuff, and we're actually planning on doing a record towards the end of the year. And then um, I still have my band. I don't really travel with it much, but it's a it's a great unit with uh, um, a lot of names that are probably people aren't too familiar with. Jimmy L. Brown's a great drummer. Sean Conley's a great, great bassist. And, um, and it's usually either great piano player George Colligan or Xavier Davis, both great piano players. It's usually one of those two. And sometimes uh, an alto player uh, named Miguel Zenon that you'll be hearing a lot more about in the future. Uh, so that's pretty much what I've been up to. Um, you know. Your sheet. Sextet, big band trio. <laughs> Sextet, big band trio. Heard that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, you know, as, a, as well as uh, playing with Jason Moran, uh, mm -hmm. piano player. Uh, Fred Hirsch, piano player. And uh, working on some other projects with uh, another drummer, Eric McPherson and uh, mm -hmm. Abraham Burton. Like mm -hmm. a trio situation. Maybe Augmented with some other. 
people. Um, yeah, aside from Andrew, I do a lot of things in the city. Um, presently, sort of co-leading trio with a pianist and a saxophone player, and we're sort of uh, playing music inspired by Bella Bartas, uh, Microcosmos, which was a series of piano study books that he wrote. So we've taken some of these etudes, or if you want to call them that, and sort of created these improvisations based on that. We did, we actually did a record, which is on Omnitone, if you want to get that. But uh, I also have this piano trio that I uh, also am in, the German piano player in Cologne, this guy Jürgen Friedrich. And uh, we're sort of not playing at the moment, you know, it's really hard being you know, across the ocean, but we're trying to set up a tour, hopefully, in 2004. <laughs> you gotta like aim, aim ahead. <laughs> but you know, there's other, you know, creative games in the city with people that maybe no one's heard of but are, you know, again, like coming up, shaping the music. Um, let me close with one final notion to throw out at Andrew. Um, I first heard your music in the 1960s when you were recording for Blue Note. It was a very rich era. A lot of creative activity and a lot of great artists who recorded with you back then. And, um, you know, some made their statement then and that was it. Some like yourself, like Wayne Shorter, who many of you probably heard here last year, um, have been able to sustain that creativity over time. Some, I suspect, many have even felt a burden of being identified as part of the legendary 1960s. Um, is it, was it uh, the glorious time some people think it was? Is it a burden to be identified with that period? How do you feel about it? Well, any time you, you live is a glorious time. <laughs> and, 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 you know, to be associated with people in that period is wonderful, like being able to associate people in, in this period, you know, to just keep a continuous flow, you know, a series of creative association with people you, you like, you know, so how could that, you know, it's not a burden because here you're doing something, you, you dream of doing it as an adolescent, you know, you, you know, you're still continuing and you're still playing with the greatest musicians on this planet, and you, you know, so, is, I find it no problem being me. <laughs> well, thank you for being you. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you all. <laughs> oh.